Hi there. Uh, and let me just check. Yeah, I think the mic is actually on and the webcam is as well. Uh, welcome to the 39th Octoprint on Air. I'm your host, Gina Heuske. Yeah, there's still no B in there. And um, yeah, it's been a while since our last one of these. Uh, I actually must have admit, must admit I was pretty damn busy with um, uh, with with the whole releases and, and all that. And it completely slipped my mind that I had to do one of these, but here we are. So, uh, and I also made, might have decided to do a live one um, instead of the recorded one last time, even though my schedule is a bit full these days, um, just simply because I wanted to make up for the whole, uh, yeah, uh, not not having gotten around to it uh, for two months now. Uh, so, um, uh, as usual, I'll, I'll give you a quick outline of what we're going to talk about, though there won't be any changes uh, to the usual format. Um, uh, I'll first tell you what I've been up to the past couple of uh, weeks since the last installment of these, then what the next steps will be. Then we'll take a quick look at the stats, and usually then there would be a short Q&A segment, but sadly there are still no questions, no new questions in the backlog. I'll keep an eye though on the live chat, and uh, in, uh, if, if there is anything that comes to your mind, during what while, while you're watching this live of course it won't work if you're watching this as a recording afterwards uh, feel free to throw the question in there and I'll do my best to answer it on air uh, though as usual um, depending on the complexity of the question uh, it might be something that I'll have to take uh, with me until the next time but I'll do my best um, yeah so uh, what I've been up to um, Obviously, uh, a lot of work on what uh, was then released as 1.6.0 and 1.6.1. And also, sorry if you're hearing a weird knocking, waggling sound. It's quite windy outside and uh, that's, yeah, it's making some noise. But yeah, I, I hope it won't be too disturbing. So uh, 1.6.0 was released on April 27th um, after a release um, candidate period of almost a month. Uh, we had three RCs, which somewhat is a bit of a custom by now. Um, the first one was uh, released on March 30th, the second one on April 14th, and the third one on April 21st, so exactly a month ago. Um, and then six days later, the full release followed. All in all, the f uh, the, the uh, whole release candidate phase saw uh, 1,702 participating instances and um, yeah, a collective seven years or actually more than seven, I think 7.2 or something like that years of print time. So yeah, I would say that one six was put through, uh, through, um, through the ropes or through the ropes. No, that that is colloquial nonsense. But you, I hope you get what I want to say. Um, uh, even before I got released, probably. And then uh, about eleven days ago, I released one six one because after we pushed one six zero out, there were two bugs that we reported uh, that were actual regressions compared to one five. Uh, one being that. Um, dragging the model around in the G-code viewer, or rather dragging the view around so the model stays put, but the view changes uh, in the G-code viewer would no longer work if you had uh, center origin uh, configured in your printer profile. This was due to some changes that um, were made for, I forgot for what actually, but um, yeah, some changes in the G-code viewer caused this as a side effect. And in the process of this, we actually paces. Thank you, Jim. It was put through the paces, um, uh, so through the through the um, process of fixing this issue, I also fixed some Azure. Pro uh, I, I fixed a larger problem with the G-code viewer, which was that it so far had not been able to um, to to react to a change in the printer profile. So now it does that as well. And uh, the other problem was that if you were um, fetching the or refreshing the, the file list while you were already printing, it would stall the communication for, uh, not the communication, but so not a communication with the printer, but rather the communication between the front end and the back end. Um, due to a timeout value in the back end that I thought was 10,000 milliseconds, but it actually turned out to be 10,000 seconds. So a bit longer than intended. I fixed that, so now it's actually 10 seconds that it's going to wait and not 10,000. 
And so no blocking will happen. Also, we'll now refuse to uh, update the SD file list while you're printing. Um, yeah, the change that caused that was that uh, starting with 1.6, if you do a refresh, it will also automatically refresh the files from the from the printer. Before that, it would use a cached version. And so that, uh, yeah, caused this somewhat as a side effect. Or rather, the bug was in there pretty much all the time, but the change in behavior caused it to surface, surface and, and uh, be somewhat disruptive all in all. Yeah, and... Um, then, yeah, as always, right after 160 hit uh, the masses and also 161, we got a number of issues on the issue tracker and uh, now mostly actually in the forums and I think also the one or other on it on Discord with people going ever since the update, something broke that could not actually have been caused by the update. So, yeah, I think by now I say this all the time, but please, when you are requesting help with a problem and when you are looking into some issues that arise with your whole instance or your whole workflow, then please at least look into the change log if the update can actually have caused it. And also please stop pinning firmware bugs and firmware problems on Octoprint. I know it's this Octoprint that most people of you are primarily interfacing with, but that doesn't mean that every single issue that arises with the printer is actually the fault of Octoprint. And I know I sound a bit frustrated saying this, and that is actually because I am, because I don't know, like 50%, maybe 70% of all issues that I, I see on our support requests that I see are, aren't actually issues with Octoprint these days, but are more like people observing weird behavior from their firmware or people running into hardware problems or people having faulty SD cards because they pulled the power up a couple of times or simply because the SD card on their Pi has run, run out of life after several years of being used or something. And it's always, this is Octoprint's fault. And then I look at it and it's not. And it's just a bit tiring and exhausting to constantly have to field questions like this. So just please, I want to help everyone. I want to solve bugs, but it would be nice if users in general, so I mean Octoprint users especially, um, would also do a bit of due diligence and make sure that a problem that is being reported is actually a problem with the software and not actually a problem with the firmware or the hardware or something else in the pipeline. I mean, it can also be a bug in the slicer. Uh, it, it doesn't always have to be Octoprint. Yeah. So sorry for that. It's just something that I had to take, uh, had to get out, uh, off my chest because it feels a bit, maybe that's also just me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe some of, of, of you who are currently in the chat and are also uh, frequently in the, in the community and all that, maybe you can also say something to that. But I feel like that's gotten worse for over the past year or so and it's it's getting worse and worse each month and it's it's just I I don't want to to do this uh, every time that I open my emails that is all <laughs> Also I'll just get in on the waving that is currently happening in the live chat Yeah all in all, so uh, just to get off my soapbox again and back uh, on topic or on the actual topic of the 160 and 161 releases, uh, so far uh, things are looking fairly nice. Uh, I mean, we have pretty amazing stats as usual. The adoption rate was good. Um, I think after a week or so, we already had uh, 160 on the majority of systems, or not, not on the majority of systems, so not in like over 50%, but more like it was the dominating version in the, in the, in the stats. And um, the printing also happens and all that. So it, it looks like it, ha it is a solid release. We also had almost no reports during the, the, during the release candidate phase, phase and the only things that had to be changed were minor. So uh, I am somewhat proud of this release because uh, yeah, it seems to have been quite un uneventful, so to speak. So no major problems, uh, no, no, no uh no um, big problems or anything um that uh that have come to my attention at least um apart from the usual stuff that always happens during pl uh, during updates where stuff fails stuff goes corrupt um 
under voltage scenarios which uh, finally block people from updating and now they report that as a bug like i cannot update why can i not update and then you look into the log and it's yeah you're on un, un, uh, you're you're running under an under voltage condition and dr print refuses to update because then that can cause issues with your system and you should really should take care of that and then the discussion start whether it's really an under under voltage situation so yeah if if the Pi detects an undervoltage situation, the Pi is throttled. Whether the undervoltage under situation is real or not is completely irrelevant, though usually it is. Um, but if the Pi detects this, then it will throttle, and all that Octoprint does is report on that. So, But I'm getting back on another soapbox. Sorry, I'm a bit competitive, I think, today, because I've, been, I've spent the past couple of hours trying to debug some problems with the new COM layer. Which brings me to this, the rest of the stuff that I've been up to. Um, so most of my time was uh, taken up the past two months by uh, two point oh, uh, two by one point six. Um, everything working up to the release candidate phase and then the release candidate phase itself, and the usual weeding through tickets in between, trying to figure out are they a regression, are they uh, normal or what. Then also some prep work for one seven. But um, I still managed to squeeze in some progress on the new COM layer. Um, I don't know actually if I showed that last time already that we now have um, like this fancy uh, connection set up with various transports that you can select various protocols that you can, can select and protocol flavors and all that. And what I also did in the meantime was um, you, so back then you also already could connect to your serial port via um, via the port baud rate connection that you know via URL. But those were different transports and I now merged that back into one, a serial transport that simply has some um has some has has three ways to establish a connection. So one is that you can connect via port baud rate combination, uh, of which both can in theory also be auto detect, though the auto detection is currently not implemented yet, but in, in theory, <laughs> that will work. Uh, the other is um, USB ID and, and baud rate. And this is something that is also currently um, a, a feature request in, in the tracker. Uh, and that is that instead of concentrating on fixed baud rates, that if, 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 on fixed port names, sorry, that can change. So for example, if you unplug the printer, plug some other serial device in and then plug the printer back in, then it will no longer be dev TDY USB O, but dev TDY USB 1. And then you are confused, or rather Octoprint is confused because it cannot find the printer under the device anymore. And what it can now, what it will now be able to do is to look at the USB ID. So the combination of the vendor ID and the product ID, which every USB device has, and which Octoprint will now also match up against, or if you want to, at least. Um, so it will, for example, allow you to always connect to uh, a specific printer device. What it currently does not take into account is also the serial number of the USB device. So maybe I should add that uh, because then if you have, for example, four different Ender threes or something, then you should, if, if they actually have different serial IDs, I have to check that. I would not su be surprised if they all, all of them have the same, but um, in, in theory, uh, then you could also distinguish between those and yeah, that's the goal here. Um, and what I'm currently trying to get to work is, so these settings, they also know save to the connection profiles, but they don't properly load back up yet, uh, which is due to the whole data model hierarchy that I'm trying to uh, get to work here, which is a bit fiddly. And, um, uh, and yeah, and also auto connect is something that I really need to get working again. So right now, it can't do that yet. It it cannot auto connect on server startup for you. And uh, as I mentioned, auto detection is also not working yet. This is also another big construction site, but big. I mean, not big in comparison to getting this thing to print, but uh, something like maybe one or two days of concentrated work on that. And concentrated work <laughs> is is that what which is always a bit tricky to come by and hard to come by and. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably just have to really get back to only two days per week, only Monday, Tuesday, concentrating on, on, on doing maintenance and all the other days being blocked for dev work because otherwise this is not going anywhere, I fear. But now 1.6 out, 6 is out, 
and we can do stuff like that again without having problems then with the next stable release. Um, yeah, and what I also did, so there were some changes uh, to 1.6 on the com layer. There were also now already some changes on 1.7 to the com layer, um, or rather to, to options for, for connection options and all that. And uh, those are also now available on the new com layer. So that was a thing of maybe tw 10 minutes, thankfully. And that was also surprisingly easy, thanks to how the thing is structured. Uh, I have to say, um, yeah, I, I have to take big breaks between working on it. But every time I get back to it, I'm happy with it. So not like when I have to work on the existing com layer, where I'm always getting extremely um, afraid of having to touch it. But in this case, it's more like, okay, everything just has its place and uh, is, is, is well located and yeah. Okay, then other stuff that I've been up to, not directly related to Octoprint, but more like to the stuff around it. You might remember that I mentioned the bundle viewer and uh, that is now actually being utilized. Uh, after we've we now so Octoprint 1.6 int introduced the system info bundles that I mentioned and uh, we uh, now also want those with the with the get help um, uh, support requests on this on the forum and I also adjusted the bug uh, report template and all that to request a system info bundle from people and in order to look into that quickly we have the bundle viewer um, that I also build which is a React um, app that I built uh, and that is available on bundleviewer.octoprint.org and uh, that has now seen quite some use also thanks to Charlie's amazing uh, view in bundle, you know, open in bundle viewer extension uh, that is also linked on bundleviewer.octoprint.org uh, by the way if you need that and um, the only thing there's a problem there still is, uh, so in theory it should also be possible if you install the bundle viewer web app on 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 your Android device, which is possible because it has a manifest uh, to if you download a bundle and to, to then share that with the app and then have it open in the app. But for some reason that is currently or rather an, an, uh, not download, but if you um, uh, if you if you hi if you share if you if you share a link to a bundle with it, it should work, but it doesn't. So uh, yeah, that is something that is still that I still do not understand at all, but that I'll hopefully figure out, or maybe Charlie will, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and yes, I mentioned the issue forms and the support template and all that now all, all also uh, require system info bundles to be shared. And th those are amazing because now we actually can see not only uh, what version of Octoprint you're running, but we also get your logs. We get, uh, if if you are running Octopi, we get the version of that. Uh, we get your Pi model if you're running on a Pi. We get the throttle state of the Pi, which is very helpful, um, uh, especially since the bundle viewer also marks up when it uh, hi highlights, when it detects that something runs throttled. Um, and we also get the terminal, tech, uh, terminal tab contents if you're currently connected to a printer and all that. So that is quite helpful and I'm really happy that I put that in and uh, I hope everyone else having to cope with this stuff is as well. Uh, it was a bit of, of work but it was well worth it. And I just saw that Jim asked if the new com layer will make serial over IP possible natively. Yeah, it will. It will. So um, I'm not sure if I can show you this. Let me check quickly. If I currently have something broken in this code or not, but uh, in theory, yeah, um, let me quickly switch you over. So um, this is the new connection dialog and um, we have serial connection, we have TCP connection and we have serial connection over TCP. So you just enter a host and port and it does the rest basically and that works. I, um, I, I um, cannot show it right now because I don't have appear against which to connect or, or server or something but that would will just talk the usual protocol over an ip connection uh, over tcp connection instead of uh, over a serial connection and tcp connection itself i think was the same just without um without uh, the the whole um line number checksum stuff because tcp natively should actually not need that um 
but yeah, I have to I have to check what exactly the difference between those two were because I've been, I implemented that two years ago. So so I, I yeah, it, I, I, it's been a bit fuzzy in my memory. But the nice thing about this is that this whole protocol thing, so the whole Rebra pro, uh, pro, uh, G code protocol, everything that most of the printers or all of, pretty much all of the printers that Octo Print supports these days talks is on the on top of that. So if you want a transport that goes over a web socket or if you want a transport that um I don't know goes over UDP however why ever you want want would want to do that or uh, I don't know carrier pigeon uh, you can do that you just have to swap out the transport layer underneath and you can just use the stuff up here with everything under here and, and the same goes I mean right now we only have one protocol implemented here but in theory you could also put a selfish uh, not selfish selfish the makeable stuff uh, protocol implementation here or whatever else you have that is not G code, some binary thing, and that could go over the same transports. So that is the basic idea here. And um, so a connection profile consists of a printer profile, a protocol with parameters and a transport with parameters. And all of these can also have, this is by the way, the thing that I meant with port and board rate or USB ID and board rate. I currently have an Arduino Mega connected here. And um, if you can com compare these, so in this case, it would use COM4 to connect. This is the description string that I parse. So you get more information now as well, not just the port, but also the information about the serial port that the system gives you. That depends a bit on the underlying operating system, but here at least it gives you this. And also on the serial device itself, of course. Or you can use USB ID, USB ID and, port, uh, and board rate. And in this case, it would use this uh, 2341 uh, colon 0042 to connect and whatever board rate you select. And then there's also URL. And URL uses the... Um, Pi serial URL handlers, uh, the RFC 2217 uh, handlers. So any kind of serial device that you can use via one of these, uh, one, one of these, UR the, these URL schemes, you will be able to also just use with Octoprint. Um, so yeah. And then there's also the usual advanced options with uh, exclusive access, low latency mode, that is a 170 feature, I think. And also expert options like parity um, and uh, the double open, the parity double open workaround that we needed on some OSs. And yeah, you can also change stuff here. Also, it's raining now, this weather. Yeah, and you can also always reset to the defaults here. Um, and some of these, uh, these things don't yet work fully, but um, most of them do. And these are the protocol parameters. So you have a bunch of firmware flavors here. And this is absolutely amazing for me or will be in the future because it allows me to react to various weird firmware variants quite easily without having to litter the whole com layer itself with all the uh, if then else statements. But instead, I can just put that in a specialized flavor and I will also see that I can make them installable via plugin. Um, as are, by the way, the transports and the um, and the protocols. And uh, then you can also override all these flavor default settings. So if you want, for example, to have more blocked commands or an ignored command, or I don't know, have different error handling, pausing behavior, all these settings that you know from Octoprint serial settings are now on the connection profile base or are on a connection base. So if you have a printer that um, has has, for example, uh, I don't know, a repetitive firmware on it, you will configure a connection profile for that. And then if you have a different printer that runs smoothieware, you can configure a connection profile for that. And it will just adapt all that and keep the settings and you will not have to constantly switch them back and forth, but you just select the right profile and all the parameters will go with it. And as a consequence of this, it will also by default not show you this whole bunch of stuff anymore, but you just yeah, have to um, do uh, configure your connection profile, uh, your connection parameters here. You can then save them, uh, which will add, add a new entry up here. And um, if you select one, it will adapt. The only problem is that right now, uh, 
it is not yet pre-filling these here properly and that is what I was debugging right before I started this um, this broadcast so yeah and also this auto connect on server startup thing currently doesn't do much but yeah also all of these are also going to be available here uh, to edit but right now the edit function is not yet there you only can set a default right now and uh, delete it but yeah that's the idea and of course the whole logging is here as well yeah so that is that also since we don't have any questions in the backlog uh, today anyhow uh, let me simply maybe quickly turn this into a bit of a code demo se section just to show you how a profile looks and uh, a flavor looks um, yeah because uh, so the default flavor is quite long um, the standard flavor because it has all these these things that you can that you have to define all the rec access that it needs for uh, for stuff and um, for the for for message matching and uh, what what settings are overridable and uh, and and all these things like block commands ignore commands all these things that we just saw and then it also has a whole ton of uh, of message matchers and parsers and message parsers and also any kind of command that you send over is now more abstract so a command hello command a get firmware info command a finish moving command and all flavors can override that to implement it differently for example and then um, let's take a look at I don't know if this is actually no that this is just for identification so they also identify get identified the, so there is auto identification of the firmware flavor to use based on connection inform, uh, information that is received from the printer during startup and that and then it can switch the flavor depending on what it gets so for example if it sees that the firmware identifies itself as, cl as clipper it will switch to the wrap uh, to the oh i need to rename that actually uh, to the clipper flavor oops that is a copy and paste error that has been in there quite a while uh, to the clipper flavor and uh, also set the unknown requires arc to true because that is one of these differences uh, between the firmwares that are present then we have a whole bunch of marlin variants here so the marlin flavor has these emergency commands heat up is a portable um, there are several kill expressions um, but there's also the marlin legacy flavor and the prusa marlin flavor which have slightly different um, identifiers and we can then use those to define overrides for these if there are any different kind of things that need handling in case of the repetitive flavor, for example, we always need to send a change, uh, a, a checksum. The SD card is always available because that thing reports stuff differently. Uh, the extruder and the bed temperature regex, uh, regexes are different. Um, and also the uh, so the whole message parsing here is different, and we also do a slightly different. Uh, um, handling of recent requests because Repetier keeps resending recent requests so they need a bit of ignoring here and there and all of that is now pushed into the flavors and the protocol implementation itself can just concentrate on using all these things to match your current printer instead of um, trying to, to match all of them yeah so that was what I quickly wanted to show you uh, lots of code <laughs> uh, I actually checked earlier and it is the whole new com layer alone is already something like one eight thousand one hundred lines or something but uh yeah that's amazing because uh it's now split over a ton of classes and files and it is no longer uh, 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 an, an almost equally long single file um so yeah okay uh sorry I forgot to switch of an alarm here and uh, that was that so uh, then um, another thing that I was up to and that was actually last weekend uh, there was the PyCon US 2021 which was virtual this year which is the only reason I was able to attend it uh, because otherwise it would have been prohibitively expensive uh, with getting to the US and all that but uh, yeah, so I took the opportunity and, and attended it uh, online and uh, watched some very interesting talks. 
uh, got a lot of ideas and also links to go through again, just like with Pi Cascades earlier this year, um, which will mostly influence uh, Octoprint 2.0. Uh, I also um, uh, actually had the opportunity to take part in a panel discussion. Uh, so there was um, the maintainer summit right before, not right before, but as part of PyCon, but not during the conference days, but a day or two days before. And um, yeah, they did a panel uh, discussion on how on, on funding open source. And uh, so I was invited to to take part in that and I did. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was fun. It was a bit like an hour, I think, or, or 30 minutes. No, an hour. I can't remember really how long it was, but an hour. And uh, I think six people or so. And yeah, it was quite interesting. Um, Video is not up yet, but it was recorded. So uh, it will be up soon, I hope. And then I'll also make sure to edit to the uh, interviews and, and talks and, and, and then such a watch list here on, on YouTube. A playlist, sorry, uh, on the on the on the Octoprint 3D YouTube channel. Uh, I also had the opportunity again to uh, do some networking, get to know some people and uh, also chat with uh, with users, which was nice. So the had they had this concept of um, of open uh, discussion spaces or yeah basically tables with uh, I think a minimum of four people and a maximum of 16 or so or 10 I don't know a uh, 10 I think it was 10 and you could just click then a video chat would get created with everyone else on the table and everyone could uh, always just join or leave whenever they wanted and all that so I got there and, and, and joined some tables and then sometimes people came in and were just like hey Gina you made Octoprint right and I was like yeah and then they were like yeah, yeah thank you and that was amazing um, and uh, yeah it also felt good to just interact with people you know like we being still in lockdown here more or less and yeah anyhow uh I guess the point of all of this is really if you can partake in any kind of virtual conferences, now is the time. Do it. I can only recommend it. My experiences in that regard have so far been uh, quite positive all over. And uh, it's actually one of the few advantages of this pandemic going on out there because stuff that usually would only be in person and never be available virtual is, is currently, has been last year and has also been this year. So... Um, yeah, I can only recommend to do it. I also registered for uh, EuroPython right away again and also handed in, uh, so um, uh, un answered the CFP basically, handed in a talk about uh, Octoprint again, lessons learned and all that. Basically um, a second or, or an updated version of my two th uh, 2019 talk now with more, uh, in more, more insight into the whole Python 3 migration situation. Um, yeah, I let's see if it will... Um, be accepted or not. If it will be accepted, you will, of course, be the first to know. Um, speaking about COVID, no, I did not get COVID, but I actually get my first shot. So yay, Team BioNTech. Uh, the people in the US, I think, call it Team Pfizer, but uh, BioNTech is just right around the corner where it was actually invented here. So I'm obviously P uh, Team BioNTech. Um, yeah, was okay. <laughs> uh, I lost about half a day of work due to feeling like utter crap, but that was about it. And also my, my arm felt like uh, I had someone um, put it under an hydraulic press or something. But all in all, it was fine. Uh, definitely better than my partner who uh, got AstraZeneca and spent a, uh, spent a day in bed with high fever. Um, so all in all, I count myself lucky not only to have got it, which is still a bit tricky in Germany, but also to to have um, made it quite unscathed through the experience. Uh, second shot, mine will be in mid June, uh, and just as a word of warning, I'm also preparing a couple of days uh, lost then, or or I'm preparing for that, uh, not not planning anything then. Um, I've heard that the second mRNA shot can really take you down. So a ton of people who got BioNTech or got Moderna in my timeline and all that were like, okay, I lost three days, <laughs> couldn't do anything, fever, uh, utter exhaustion and no, no, no power anymore. So I'm just planning around that currently. But yeah, just so you know, uh, in case you don't hear anything from me in mid-June for a couple of days, that will be the reason. Um, right, so that was that. Uh, then... What are the next steps? So, uh, 
uh, uh, some work has actually already been done towards 170, uh, even though that definitely is far from having a release date. Um, so uh, there were some performance improvements, courtesy of Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so the plugin viewer now loads faster because he optimized some stuff there with regards to the server turnarounds and uh, the um, the modals, all the modals, so the settings dialog and all that also now pop up way faster because he switched them from JavaScript to CSS. So that was awesome. Uh, and I also have to make sure to take care of that with all the modals that I introduced in the newcom layer or rather in the UI that is attached to the newcom layer. Um, a change that I did last week is, uh, or rather, no, this week, this week, oh, there, this week, um, Octoprint will now on Python 3 no longer sluggify uploaded file names. So if you upload something and this, that consists purely out of emojis and then .g code, it will persist it like that precisely on disk. And if you download it, it will also be named like this again and all that. Um, uh, Jim just f uh, said file folder renaming, right? There was also some, some change there. So, um, uh, in, I think it was one five, <laughs> uh, we introduced that you can, um, move and copy right from the file, the file viewer in, in Octoprint. And now in this move dialogue, you can also rename. So you could, for example, move a folder or a file to the same location it's already at, but rename it in a process, which effectively is a rename. Um, so that is there now. Uh, then there was a really, really nasty G code viewer issue, which almost cost me my sanity um, and which turned out to be most likely a Chrome bug. So um, there was this this funny situation where uh, in, 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 in G code files that had been processed by Arc Welder uh, and for which Arc Welder produced some some arcs that were very short, but with a really large radius. Uh, so something like 100 meter radius for almost a straight line in the resulting G code. Um, but not quiet, like it still had a bit of a round, but I don't know if it's this, if, if this is me, maybe even an Arcrel bug, but still this code is valid. So uh, it's something the G-Code viewer has to cope with. And in, in these cases, the, 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 um, the canvas implementation, the 2D canvas implementation in Chrome seems to have a bit of a rounding bug going on or something, because instead of just going from the start to the end point of the arc curve, it would go, uh, it would overshoot. And uh, that then produces, of course, rendering artifacts. And um, yeah, that took quite a while to figure out. Uh, and the result in the end was that in Chrome, Octoprint's G-Code viewer will now switch to uh, to drawing the arcs with, uh, with, with splines, which is a bit suboptimal, which is also why you can disable it. But uh, it actually performs almost the same. So um, I couldn't notice any change in performance on my rig. But as I said, it, it, just in case, it's it's something that you can disable if you don't care about the rendering artifacts. Uh, and if you want to read a bit more about that, maybe I also wrote a blog post about that, but on my personal blog. So at foozle.net, uh, if you want to check that out, I don't know. Um, just in case anyone is interested in, in, in following the steps of my debugging session that went into that. And uh, yeah, also some other things that went into 170 that I honestly can't remember right now, <laughs> but yeah, some some stuff. Yeah, then of course, um, uh, apart from what is already in 70, I also want to of course work. So whatever comes up in the in the maintenance department during my Mondays and and Tuesdays, so to speak, will go in there, and everything else uh, I'll try to concentrate on 2.0 so that we can finally get this com layer finished. I can't tell you how much I really need to get this off my to-do list. The thing I, I've been off and on working on this and its prior iteration now for pretty close to six years. And I, I don't want to see it anymore, honestly. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, there's also one thing that I want to see if I can maybe slice some time out of it, uh, out for it, because it would also be a good practice again, uh, which is, um, yeah, we currently have data.octoprint.org, which is, yeah, uh, very quickly um, 
put together J uh, JavaScript based uh, viewer for some of the data uh, exports, but uh, I wanted to look if I can maybe just give it a bit of a more polished uh, appearance with a React and, and, and Material UI uh, based um, more interactive side. But yeah, that's something that I will only do if I really, if either I need a little bit of a pick me up, <laughs> uh, because frankly, stuff like that can be good to just get your head free again from all the com layer stuff. Or if I uh, run into some downtime or something. Uh, and speaking of that, uh, chances are chances are really good at that point. So I, I know I said that for the new uh, for the new UI that uh, Octoprint desperately needs, I wanted to evaluate a bunch of of, of, of options. Most importantly, React and Vue.js, and I still haven't gotten around to actually taking a proper look at Vue.js. But based what I've seen now from from React, and based on the small things that I know about Vue, I think I'll just stick with React. Um, it seems to have the bit of adoption out there. There's a ton of, uh, um, of, of apparently quite solid libraries out there. And um, once you wrap your head around it, I think it might actually be the easier one of the two. But and the wrapping your head around it isn't wasn't that bad as I thought it would be. Once I looked into the moder more modern React, because since React 16, I think they introduced uh, the function-based um, uh, the function-based components, and those are pretty damn straightforward. So the class-based ones are, were a bit confusing uh, to me, which I did first in a in a in a in a, in a course. But the the, the function-based ones they are really easy to do, in my opinion. I mean, maybe someone else will see this differently, but I guess there is also a reason why it's so popular. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the building, the building, uh, the bundle view and also my new private homepage in React was uh, a good experience. Uh, the next step will be some experimentation to figure out if there is a good way to create or rather to, to yeah, to, to get pluggable front-end components supplied by plugins in there. So um, basically right now, if you want to have component, if you want to use components in, in your standard run of the mill React app, you, um, from my experience, which is still very limited. So if I speak any stupid stuff now, please excuse that. But as far as I understand it, you usually just pack it up into your, into your whole, uh, bundle, which usually is created by something like web app, uh, web, web pack. And then it's just already loaded in the browser and you can just use it. But in the case of plugins, uh, the bundle for the UI, for the main UI of Octoprint will be created, will be, will be a different one from, from all the plugins. So we need a way to dynamically load in plugin bundles, plugin files, and then also extension points inside the application itself in order to load those. So that is something that I still need to figure out if there maybe is some existing prior art, so to speak, that does stuff like that without me having to reinvent the wheel. And otherwise it will be a case of having to figure out a way to do that uh, so that it is um, easy and fun to use because the last thing we want is, um, is making it hard on people. And uh, yeah, I'm also trying to, t to take some lessons here from the whole th situation that we currently have with UI work in plugins, which I understand is quite hard, especially due to the knockout JS choice that I made back in 2012, <laughs> um, because all this view model madness can really drive you up the, up the wall. I mean, it drives me up the wall and I've been using that stuff extensively. Um, so I can totally understand that this is a bit of an, of a steep learning curve for, for people right now. So I hope that using the most popular, uh, framework that is currently in existence will hopefully mitigate this a bit in the future. But yeah, that's just, that is not something that I will do until the next time. That was just more like the big perspective that I wanted to give here, more like an outlook. All right, then uh, I also want to show you some stats because I always show you some stats here. And of course, these stats here did not load properly. Wait. Okay, then we start with these. Uh, let me quickly switch you over here. Yeah, so um, this is the past seven days. 
Uh, no, not much change here actually. So this, these numbers are pretty constant and consistent over the time. What we see here is that uh, 161 overtook 153 um, around here. <laughs> yeah. Around here. Yeah, okay, around here. So around uh, May, May 17th as the most, uh, as the, as the biggest, um, uh, how do you say, as the majority, no, not as the majority, but as the, as the leading version number, let's say it that way. And, uh, one six also immediately went down again after one, one six one was released, though I hope that maybe the, no, the 30 day stats refuse to load right now. I think I might have overloaded the tracking server again. That sometimes happens because that thing really is a bit, I mean, it's fine for putting the data in, but getting the data back out sometimes is a bit too much for it. <clears throat> Still, let's give it another <coughs> try. Sorry, my throat is extremely dry right now. Uh, and in the meantime, let's take a look at, first of all, this thing here, which is absolutely amazing. Um, we almost are at, at a 50-50 split between Python 3, which is the yellow one here, and P Python 2, which is the green one here. And you can expect me to um, pop, a, pop a virtual champagne bottle, a virtual only because I don't drink, um, on the day that this yellow one here is the bigger one. So uh, is the majority. That is going to be soon, I hope, and that is going to be some some very very good day indeed and uh, then there is also a new stat here which is the printer state so since uh, since one six octoprint will now also with the ping event which happens every 15 minutes report the current printer state uh, whether it's printing idle or offline or offline with an error uh, because i simply was interested in if there were some were there any any kind of patterns and also if all the printers that are currently out there are all of a sudden offline with an error, then there's probably some issue with Octoprint. So that is the idea here. And uh, yeah, um, what's interesting actually is that half of the printers at any given time are only idle, uh, are, are actually offline and not connected. And then uh, the majority of the rest is idle and then the rest is only printing. So uh, that pretty much looks like uh, yeah, looks like my own pattern, I have to admit, like only 25%, less than 25%, maybe 20% uh, of the printer. So a fifth uh, is actually printing and the rest is not. So that was kind of fun. And also, of course, the usual fluctuations. People print during peak hours and don't print in non-peak hours, which is funny because those coincide with more like with the US times, I think, than with the European times, but they are still pretty close to them. So, yeah. And uh, the printed hours per version over time are also somewhat uninteresting right now because they are, have already settled here. Does this still not load? No, it doesn't. So, sorry for that. I, I wish I could have given you the last 30 day uh, thing because that would also show you the rise of the... Let me maybe check that. Or is the query completely broken right now because we can also see that with the 160RC thing maybe yeah that still loads okay so if we switch it to 60 days and this is only the RC version so the stable 16 release is not in there But then you you see I always love these uh, these graphs I gotta admit because you clearly see when each RC was released and also when the final one then was released because that is pretty much here. Uh, we can maybe actually switch to this view. Uh, yeah, we can try. It's also interesting that the major that, that the majority of people testing the RC actually printed. Uh, or printed more and and then when it hits the the oh no wait that is sorry forget it that i forgot that this only contains the rcs not the yeah it's calculating a whole ton right now 
Also, it's getting warm in here because I had to close the window. <laughs> okay. Yeah, while it's still calculating, we can take another look at that. But um, yeah, uh, just to, as a reminder for everyone who doesn't know yet, there is also data.octoprint.org where you can see these aforementioned statistics here, which are compiled from the exports that you can find under export and which contain like Octoprint version distribution for 7 and 30 days, Python 2 versus 3, 7, 30 days, Python version for 7, 30 days. And what we also now have there is um, a new export actually, which is the aforementioned printing stats for 30 days and 7 days. Uh, and also the plugin stats, which I know are the plugin authors are all over for creating nice stats from those for their own plugins. Yeah. So has this recovered in between yeah so you see that compared to the actual um uh, to the release candidates um the actual number of stable instances is a bit larger like the the the, the big the big a sawtooth pattern that we just saw before i switched from 160rc to 160 is these little things down here. Uh, yeah. And this was when 161 went out. So um, you can also see that people print a whole lot. And yeah, but still, it's always a bit interesting to see, I think. Also, how many hours? I mean, yeah, I don't know how many years those are, but it's a ton. Right. Um, that was the stats. Back to me. Uh, I don't think we have any questions. We also don't have that much activity today overall and only I think seven, six viewers right now. So apparently most uh, people had something else to do today, which is no problem. I mean, we record these so everyone can watch them whenever they see fit. Um, but yeah, um, considering that there are no questions and I'm through with everything that I prepared and I think I don't have anything amazing to show off right now anymore, just some bugs to fix. Uh, I'll just uh, wrap this up now, I guess. So next one of these, as always, I'll try to do it uh, uh, in around a month, but uh, the usual stuff of real life getting in the way or um, Octoprint getting in the way, which is also uh, a ton of, 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 of uh, times the reason for delays uh, can happen. Uh, but uh, I will just announce it on, uh, on Patreon as always, or maybe I'll just pre-recorded again that is also an option i have to see it, it all depends on what is what happens in four weeks and then what, what is current then and what i have to take care of um yeah apart from that i hope uh it was interesting and uh, thank you for being here and uh yeah also for letting you sh uh, letting me uh, show you uh around the the code a bit the new com layer code a bit and, and brag a bit about all the stuff that I put in there. Um, and uh, until next time, I guess, uh, or until we see each other in, disc in the, on the Discord, like Jim just said, um, happy printing and take care, stay safe and all this stuff. Bye.